Welcome to Feminist Question Time, brought to you by Women's Declaration International, the leading global organisation defending women's sex-based rights against the threats posed by gender identity ideology. There's more information on the website womensdeclaration.com, where you will find our Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights, which has been signed by 33,010 people from 160 countries and is supported by 463 organisations. We have over 100 volunteer activists, including 53 country contacts, engaged in defending women's rights. I'm really pleased to say that today we have Borbala Juhash from Hungary. She will speak um, well, on the topic Hungary, anti-gender ideology raised to state level, phase two. We have Christina Ellenson from Norway, and she will give us an update on the situation regarding gender identity ideology politics in Norway. We have Claudia from the UK, who will speak on censorship in the visual arts and how that has enabled the attack on feminist artists. I'm really pleased to introduce our first speaker, who is, speaker, who is Borbala Juhash. She is a feminist historian, right now working at a state elementary school in Budapest, Hungary. Um, Borbala worked at the Hungarian Women's Lobby for 14 years, both as a volunteer and as a leader and an employee. She was president, vice president of the European Women's Lobby for two years. Borbala also work, works as a freelance gender policy expert in the original sense, and her main interests are women in women's rights are the fight against prostitution, women's history, women in education, and women in decision making. She lives in Budapest with her daughter. So thank you so much for coming back <laughs> and speaking to us again and uh, for all the work you do. Um, and over to you, Paul Bala. So I'm actually going to talk about two things uh, about Hungary, uh, so-called the child protection referendum, or as uh, others say, it, uh, homophobe referendum, and then about an international lesbian conference that happened last week in Budapest. Leader of Hungary, who is Viktor Orban, and now he's the prime minister for the fourth time since 2010, and he uh, also was a prime minister between uh, in the early uh, 2000s, from 1998 to 2002, but since 2010, he and his party called Fidesz uh, been uh, in the government, and they started using the topic of uh, so-called gender ideology, by which they mostly mean actually uh, LGBT uh, rights and trans uh, movement rights, but also criticize uh, feminism as well. They have made it as one of their main political uh, message or ideological message, uh, and uh, especially the past four years have been spent uh, talking about this topic, obviously this resulted uh, in the opposition uh, talking uh, in a pro way about these topics. And I think this was an antagonism uh, and uh, uh, everything went, I think, according to uh, Orban's plan. This is a repetition of uh, my last year talk. Uh, he is the guy I was talking about, Viktor Orban. You could see him as a very young liberal politician after the political changes in Hungary. He was already a politician after 1989. And on the right hand uh, side, you can see him uh, as already uh, several times prime minister. He's a great fan of uh, football. He used to be a professional football player himself, and uh, he's holding this uh, Hungarian colors and the name of Hungary uh, right there. Uh, last year, Hungary uh, voted on a so-called child protection law, which was called the homophobic law by his opposition. And what he said about this law in the um, European Parliament was the following. I'm happy to tell them that there is no law of any kind 
relating to homosexuality. This law is not about that. This law is about the education of children, their education regarding any sexual content. It is the duty of parents to decide how their children become acquainted with issues related to sexuality. At the same time, it is the duty of the state to create the conditions which enable parents to meaningfully exercise these rights of theirs. This is a law about the protection of children and parents. I am a committed defender of rights. I was a freedom fighter during communism when homosexuality Homosexuality is a punishable offense. I fought for freedom and rights, which means that I also fought for the rights of homosexuals, said the Hungarian prime minister last June in Brussels. This child protection, or in other words, homo, in other interpretations, homophobic uh, law uh, has become a great scandal in Europe and uh, Orban has become a kind of an outcast on the political uh, arena. Nevertheless, he won the elections in April as well. This is just a, a very short uh, part of that particular law of child protection law of 2021. And I'm not going to read it out, the whole thing. Uh, we talked about it last August. Uh, but it says that the state shall protect the right of children to self-identity according to their sex at birth. So you can see that uh, this sex change is in the core of uh, the bill, and it goes further and further. Um, and unfortunately, it also meant that any type of sexuality education uh, is now out of the schools in Hungary. There's never been a very systematic and uh, holistic sexuality education, unfortunately, in Hungary. There was some kind of a uh, sexuality education attached to biology, the study of biology. Uh, but now all NGOs uh, are uh, uh, forbidden to enter the schools to give any trainings to children. And although the ministry has promised to set up a list of those NGOs that can enter the school and give uh, SRHR education, for example, this list has never been set up. So NGOs cannot enter the schools. Now there is no sexuality education, not even conservative uh, NGOs can enter the schools. The election in April 2022 in Hungary was a big deal because the opposition this time, all uh, six parties and movements united, just like in other countries, for example, in Israel, where it was a successful uh, united opposition a few years ago. They united in Hungary because they saw that mathematically then it would be possible to beat the Fidesz Christian Democratic uh, Party coalition. And uh, they were unsuccessful. So the Fidesz uh, Christian Democratic Party coalition won for the fourth time with a two third majority. And the uh, two opposing kind of message that these two groups, the united opposition from the far right through uh, the liberals to the left, uh, and the Greens, uh, actually what the message was is kind of we are not Orban and we choose Europe. So we are Europe, Orban is not Europe, uh, you know, vote us. And uh, the very simple message of the uh, government or Orban was let's protect our children. This is a poster from the uh, election. It was a government poster, actually, because, as I will say, they ran a referendum campaign and the caption says, let's protect our children, vote with a no on the 3rd of April. And I will explain what this referendum was. I analyzed this whole campaign and I found that uh, secretly Fidesz was actually building up on women voters with the... Uh, uh, emphasizing family policy, with emphasizing security. And uh, of course, in the meantime, the uh, Ukrainian-Russian uh, war started and we are a neighboring country, country to Ukraine. So it was, again, uh, very interesting when the oppositional media found out that this photo is a stock photo of a Russian uh, mother and a Russian uh, daughter. The referendum on child protection uh, happened on the same day as the general elections. So you went to the polling booth and you voted for the politicians, but at the same time, you had the chance to vote for the four following questions. Question number one, do you support the teaching of sexual orientation to minors in public education institutions without parental consent? Question number two, do you support the promotion of sex reassignment therapy for underage children? 
Question three, do you support the unrestricted exposure of underage children to sexually explicit media content that may affect their development? And question number four, do you support the showing of sex change media content to minors? There was a planned fifth question, which uh, would have run, do you support the availability of non-conversion treatments for uh, minors? But this was uh, cancelled by the Supreme Court of Hungary. And although the Constitutional Court overturned this decision in December, following a complaint by the government, finally the government did not want to reopen the question. So we stuck with the four, question, four previous questions. Uh, you could see the uh, the voting, the ballot the, with the four questions. It was very simple. You could say yes or no. Of course, as I think it was according to Fidesz's political uh, mobilization design, but uh, the Amnesty International Hungary and Háttér Association, which is originally a gay association, right, an LGBTQ association, um, and we have actually, as Hungarian Women Lobby, we uh, have worked together with them on different uh, issues because they are very famous uh, human rights based uh, NGOs. They ran a campaign uh, to tell voters uh, to vote uh, in an invalid way, either by uh, putting an X to both yes and both no, or by uh, drawing some, some funny thing uh, on the uh, uh, ballot. So it's not valid, because of course they could not really campaign to vote uh, with a yes to these questions, whether you would like to show them explicit media content of uh, sex change, or whether you support the sex change of uh, young children and their in, in the sexuality education, etc. So they did not want to, and nobody wanted to say, yes, let's vote with a yes. But they didn't want to say, let's vote with a no, because they, they found that many of the, these questions are actually um, homophobic, and they serve the political purpose of uh, Orban. And this picture is uh, actually from the website that were uh, uh, for this campaign, for this let's vote in an invalid campaign, uh, which became a big deal. And a lot of teenagers also helped Amnesty International put posters and stickers everywhere. And, you know, we were, they were carrying these bags with let's vote in an invalid way. So it was a big campaign. Now, on the day of the election, uh, some this is the uh, website of th that campaign, Vote in an Invalid Way. There were some funny pictures who took it seriously. You see on the left-hand side, somebody was drawing Orban's uh, picture and he's wearing makeup. Somebody else just, uh, you know, put holes into both questions. And the very funny one uh, wrote, uh, Brussels uh, is sending the message stop homophobia and then uh, the picture shows uh, the uh, ex-Fides politician uh, Josef Sayer who was a European Parliament member and during the Covid uh, lockdown in Brussels he went to a big uh, uh, gay uh, sex party in the middle of Brussels and when the police uh, knocked uh, down on this party because they were illegally gathering during the uh, Covid lockdown he escaped on a pipe and a water pipe drain uh, and uh, it was in a kind of uh, opposition of what uh, Fidesz is saying about Christian values and family values and how uh, Sire uh, family man by the way, and the founding member of Fidesz was behaving. So this uh, funny picture refers to that. He resigned from Fidesz and he's not a politician anymore. Now, what are what were the results and what are the interpretations? Very funny. Everybody says that it was a success. Fidesz says that the uh, referendum was a success and the opposition also says it was a success. The validity limit uh, of the referendum would have been 4 million and you see the uh, numbers people. Well, uh, not enough people voted so the referendum in that sense was not valid. But if we look at the uh, ratio of yes and no answers in the, uh, um, you know, for each question, you could see that question number one, uh, 3 million 251 uh, and uh, thousands seven. Uh, 736 people voted with a no. So actually there was a quite high number of uh, people saying no. 
question number two, very similar ratio. So although in all of the questions it, it was invalid, but of those people who voted, uh, the majority voted no of these questions. Question three, again, you can see the ratio. The no's have a majority of all those who voted and question four is very, very similar. So the opposition said we won this idea because the referendum was invalid. However, Fides also that well, we, it was invalid, okay, that's a minor legal question, but so many people voted no on these questions that any further um, uh, law should take this into account. And also political scientists with the simple mathematical calculation found that there is a discrepancy between the oppositional voters and people who voted with no. So there are 6,100 or 700,000, sorry, 6,000 or 700,000 people who voted for the united opposition, but they also voted to these questions of Fidesz with a no. So that's a big puzzle for the political scientists now. Uh, I could have a solution, but I was not asked. Yeah, and this is the mystery, as I said, that out of the Fidesz KDM, uh, Christian Democratic uh, Coalition voters, about 3 million, uh, there were uh, other votes who voted with no. Uh, what happened after that, and even during the, uh, the whole of the spring, when everybody was preparing for this uh, big deal, uh, election that uh, Matthias Corvinus Collegium Press or MCC Press, this is a, the actual institution is not new, but they were given a lot of money by the government. Uh, it's an independent foundation. They run a whole set of educational, uh, further education program and in a college system to raise uh, conserve, very well-trained conservative uh, youth and thinkers. And they also have a publication uh, company, the MCC Press. They bought all the rights of several uh, gender critical or trans uh, critical authors, including you can see irreversible damage by uh, Abigail Schreier. Uh, they kept the original uh, cover, so you can identify that, the, one, uh, the second from the right, and also Helen Joyce, but other conservative authors as well, like the French Eugene, Eugene Bastier or Birgit Keller uh, from Germany, who are conservative uh, writers. So it was flooded, Hungary was flooded with this gender critical and uh, uh, conservative uh, gender critical literature in the spring. Uh, this is a Hungarian author and the Hungarian book. Esther Kovács is a young Hungarian uh, political scientist, a left-wing political scientist who wrote uh, her thesis, uh, PhD thesis, on the comparison of the German anti-gender uh, movement and the Hungarian anti-gender movement the AFD party, uh, the AFD party in Germany and Orbán's Hungary. And uh, this came out in a book called Gender Crazes in Germany and Hungary. It's a gender critical book, but a very, very base, very good analysis and very thorough scientific uh, analysis uh, of the two uh, movements. And I'm very happy that this book uh, appeared because now it has been launched uh, just uh, uh, two weeks ago, it was launched two weeks, weeks ago, but now finally we have a book to refer to. And uh, finally, uh, some fun facts about the Lesbian Resistance Conference, the EL, EL Asterix C conference that happened in Budapest. You could see it was two weeks ago, last weekend. Uh, I did not take part in this conference, but uh, some of the organizers were um, the lesbian. Uh, Association lobbies, the Lesbian Association. Uh, and I think partly this conference came to Hungary uh, to show solidarity with us under the uh, Orban regime. And what happened on this lesbian conference? Kathleen Stock also took part on this conference. She was invited and she wrote a very good article about the conference and the dilemma on cultural colonialism by Western donors of Hungarian and East European feminist and lesbian movement. And I decided to quote from it because I think, first of all, it's her mother tongue, English is her mother tongue. And uh, she um, 
summarize our dilemma very, very well. And it's also interesting how she saw this Budapest conference, which was very, very international. It was all in English, of course. So uh, I'm quoting from Kathleen Stock, uh, author of Material Girls. Officially, the story from the stage, I mean, the stage of the lesbian conference, was that the Rainbow Coalition needed to stick together like glue against the anti-gender backlash currently being waged by Orban, Putin, Erdogan and others. No queer left behind. For these self-styled strongmen, gender, vaguely defined, is a strategically useful symbol for everything terrible about the decadent West. Inevitably, a polarized situation has emerged with both sides insisting the T be lumped together with the LG and B for good or ill. On one side, Fidesz used the extremes of Western trans activism to justify incursions on the rights of women, gays, and the sex non confirming generally. And on the other, in the name of solidarity, Hungarian and Western progressives insist there is no difference between these extreme demands and more state requests, more state requests like being able to teach school children about homosexuality or demanding the right to gay marriage. Continue. Left-wing gender critical lesbian like those I met in that Budapest bar, because uh, Kathleen Stock, after the official conference, also met some gender critical lesbians. Uh, some of them are, are good friends and colleagues of mine in a Budapest bar. So in that Budapest bar are stuck in the middle of all this, a means to everyone else ends. The state paints them as deviant and anti-family to bash the liberals, while progressives in Hungary and their Western supporters demand that they pretend that their interests perfectly align with the rest of the rainbow. If lesbians nonetheless insist perfectly sensibly that female biology makes a difference to their political interests as lesbians, they are treated as somehow in league with the far right. And uh, I think in the West, far right, like Orban is uh, seen as a far right uh, politician. And finally, the last uh, quotation, the international rejection, rejection of extreme trans ideology will be a pyrrhic victory if it is accompanied by a raft of measures against women, gays, and sex non-conferring people, says Kathleen Stock in an article. You see uh, Kathleen Stock's uh, photo on the right-hand side, and on the left-hand side, you see uh, an Austrian uh, activist of the same conference who helped found this conference, fundraised for it and uh, moderated it and one of the moving force behind this uh, lesbian conference. And what happened? Her name is Faika El Nagashi from Vienna, Austria, a longtime lesbian activist and an ex-ESC board member. She registered to the conference. She bought her ticket and arranged the accommodation. And one night before her trip to Budapest, Hungary, she was told that her registration was revoked because her recent public statements uh, violated the ESC's core values. So uh, she came to Hungary, but she was not allowed to take part on the conference. Uh, uh, a Hungarian gender critical uh, journalist and musician, Zsófia uh, Balog, made a podcast uh, with her. Uh, you could see, uh, you could listen to it on uh, her Facebook page. And she also uh, wrote, uh, uh, there was, a, no, not she, but a small uh, piece was written about it in afterellen.com. You can read it. And that is actually my, my, la, my last slide. With your decision to exclude me from the conference set Faika El Nagashi, or tweeted, she tweeted, you have gone down with a divisive path. You know me, my track record, my work, my commitment. I have not changed. With your decision, you say to lesbians everywhere, there is no space for you here. I am more convinced than ever to speak up for the visibility and rights of lesbians, for our differences and for what we share. I am in Budapest. My direct messages are open. I'm happy to meet, discuss and connect and to rebuild an actual lesbian movement. Well, eventually she happened to meet some gender critical lesbians in that bar and also with Kathleen, uh, Kathleen Stock. Uh, so I thought uh, this is a short uh, summary of what has happened in Hungary uh, in the past one year regarding gender, both on the international arena, like this international conference in Budapest and in Hungarian political life. And there is one more thing, but uh, there's no time to speak about it. Uh, little change was done uh, recently to the uh, Hungarian abortion law, which is an old 1993 uh, relatively liberal uh, abortion law. Now, 
the doctor has to show to the pregnant uh, mother some kind of a sign of uh, life. It could be the heartbeat or it could be just the uh, of the uh, the screen uh, before uh, signing that she can have an abortion. And a lot uh, and so. It- Abortion, ha- abortion debate has actually arrived to Hungary as well, although Orbán explicitly said that they are not going to make it uh, uh, more strict, stricter because the Hungarian population wouldn't want it. It's true. So Hungary is not going to go down on the Poland way, we think, but uh, it's already uh, back on the agenda. So our next speaker is Christina Ellinson from Norway. She's the country contact for Women's Human Rights Campaign in Norway and is going to give us an update of what's happening in Norway and um, what how it's going. So thank you so much, Christina, and over to you. It's just uh, really depressing <laughs> to hear about this rock in a hard place, but it's like we've always known it uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's uh, heartbreaking in a sense that uh, the women's movement have been sort of taken hostage between these different political movements. But then again, uh, women should never have been sort of tied down to anybody else's political agenda anyway. So, um, yeah, uh, so it shouldn't really make a difference. Like we still have the same things that we need to work for and argue for, regardless of the political sort of climate. So, um, yeah, well, I was supposed to talk a little bit about my case um, and... um, maybe also uh, about the sort of interviews that I've been doing uh, the last couple of months. But to be honest, I was completely sidetracked today because I've just been listening to, uh, what's her name? Laura, oh, I I think I got it wrong. Um, uh, LP, that's the artist's name. I've just been listening to her heartbreak on repeat in sort of homage to the International Lesbian Day. (laughs) So um, I'm just going to sum up, instead of like talking about like the interviews and sort of justifying why I'm talking to the left, I mean to the right, um, which I have been done, you know, uh, which I've done just both in in terms of going on Taki Carlson, uh, but also I recently did an interview for a German conservative newspaper, which um, uh, which uh, I personally thought was really good. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I decided, I thought I'll, I'll try to sort of list up the progression of uh, gendered identity in Norwegian law. Um, because it is kind of, yeah, I'm just going to go for it. So Norway removed, the first thing that happened in Norway was that uh, trans activists lobbied for the removal of transvestic fetishism to belong in the diagnosis criteria the diagnostic diagnostic classification of a fetish so that was the first thing that happened that happened in 2009 and all of a sudden transvestic fetishism wasn't a fetish anymore and that brought on a wave of men claiming to be women Uh, and it also brought with it this new uh, vocabulary of trans persons and then this concept gendered identity um, it started flooding the mainstream media and then it started flooding like legislation and politicians um, and then once that was done in 2013 uh, the concept of gender identity was then included in Norwegian discrimination law and then the discrimination law then went from being protecting like specific characteristics and it became this kind of catch all thing where women's rights and uh, and sex based discrimination law was sort of sort of lumped together with all the other characteristics race sexual orientation and then this new uh, gendered identity And this uh, decision was made without any assessments to how it would impact women and girls. Uh, The next step that happened was that in 2015, the Norwegian tax department cited the supposed rights and needs of, and I quote here, transvestites in their decision to remove biological sex as an identity marker. 
This decision was also made without any assessments to how the removal of biological sex as an identity marker would affect women, even though it is women who almost exclusively is affected by such a decision. But the needs of transvestites, which is of course still a term referring to men with a fetish, you know, regardless of the diagnostic classification, um, their, their rights, their needs were uh, assessed in several paragraphs. And um, now it's decided that Norway will introduce gender neutral identification numbers by 2032, where biological sex will be completely removed as an identity marker. And this is all in line with um, the Yoga Carta principles, which uh, very clearly states that, that this is the goal. Um, then in 2016, Norway implemented a law that made it technically impossible to differentiate between biological sex and the concept of gendered identity. The purpose of the law was to remove the criteria of having a diagnosis in order to change legal sex. The campaign was waged using the techniques described in the now notorious Denton's Manual, um, by attaching the proposal to a more popular reform, uh, to give it a protective veil, uh, avoiding media attention, and by targeting youth politicians in order to have them present the necessary arguments uh, to the different political parties. And I'm quoting here because this is what it says in that manual. Uh, by having the, the youth political parties present the necessary changes, to the uh, political parties. Uh, it would give the impression that the proposal came from within the party rather from an external political lobby organization. Um, and of course, they also lied, straight up lied. They spun this narrative that um, it was a condition on changing legal sex that the person applying for the legal uh, change had undergone uh, chemical, you know, had undergone so-called uh, sex reassignment. Um, but this was never the case. Uh, so they outright lied and said that the current legal, legal uh, legislations required the sterilization of trans persons uh, in order for them to be recognized for who they really are. Uh, which uh, was not true because uh, there was, you know, so-called sex reassignment was never a condition in order to change legal sex in Norway. Uh, the only condition there was, was to have a medical diagnosis. So by now in 2013, within then seven years, they had removed uh, fetishism, you know, transvestic fetishism as a fetishistic diagnosis, you know, a diagnosis of, of fetishism. And then they, uh, now removed um, the criteria to have a medical diagnosis in order to change or to apply to change legal sex. So the campaign succeeded uh, above all expectations. Uh, nor in Norway, anyone now can change their legal sex regardless of age actually, but from the age of six, six years and older, you don't need a medical diagnosis. Um, and the children, children between the ages of six and 16 can change their legal sex with only one consenting parent. Um, but they can also change the legal sex without any parental uh, consent by going, you know, they've, they've opened up a loophole for, for children essentially to do that without parental consent. Uh, it's also possible for um, a married, a married spouse to change their legal sex without even informing their partner. And it's no, there's no criteria to have, you know, the, the, the spouse doesn't have any rights in terms of, you know, leaving their marriage if they want to. So uh, Norway have the most liberal and the most um, sort of radical laws regarding self-ID. And there is no system in place for tracking the number of people who change their legal sex, and it's in technically impossible to check if a person has changed legal sex based on the new identification number. So in Norway, when you change your legal sex, it's actually processed by the tax department. Um, your identification number in Norway uh, includes 
uh, data, well, at, at least now it does. It includes data on sex and age. Um, so female is denoted by an even number uh, and male is denoted by an odd number. So basically, when you change your legal sex in Norway, you're given a new identification number, and there are no there are no sort of technical way of checking if a person has changed, you know, has gotten a new identification number. Um, and um, without, and it's also impossible to confirm whether or not the variable sex is referring to sex or if it's referring to this concept, gendered identity. Uh, the law in 2016 was also passed without any assessments on the impact it would have on women's rights. The year following the implementation of self-ID, the number of women reported for rape more than tripled. But the change in the definition of the variable, variable sex was never addressed. Um, and it's also technically impossible to uh, accurately verify the sex of these women. Um, and then, so following this, this was in 2016. And so we already seen like this whole, just repeated, repetitively and systematically women's concerns, like the, the just even thinking about women uh, and their existing rights and the impact these massive changes to the variable sex will be having for women. It's not considered once. I mean, we're, you know, they've considered transvestites, but they never considered women. So then in 2020, the concept of gender identity was proposed to be included in Norwegian criminal law, and in particularly into the hate crime laws. And by now, um, I had made uh, I've been made aware of trans activism. So this is 20, well, autumn 2019. Um, and by now I've been made aware of trans activism, uh, trans activism there and the intensely misogynist and homophobic nature of both their demands uh, and the tactics. And I've also been made aware of the growing movement of women who are voicing their protests um, and who demand but this erasure of women's sex-based rights needs to stop. So I went to that hearing um, on behalf of Women's Declaration Norway. And then I told them that if they passed this law, it was guaranteed that women would start being reported to the police for hate crime, simply for having an objective understanding of biological sex. Because as we all know, uh, biological sex has been declared hateful and the colonial bias, which, yeah. Um, nonetheless, the law came into, into effect in 2021. Uh, I was informed by police in May of this year uh, that I was under police investigation suspect, suspected for hate speech. So the alleged hate speech includes every single interaction I've had since the law came into effect. Uh, that I've had with an employee at the leading LGBTQ lobby organization in Norway. Uh, this employee is a man who claims to be a lesbian mother, uh, and his job is to be an advisor on gender and sexuality. So he reported every interaction we'd had for an entire year since the law came into effect. And then when police opened investigation, he also included a TV debate that we had. So I'm still waiting to hear from the police uh, on what they're going to do, um, uh, or whether or not I will be charged with a crime for stating facts like men cannot be lesbian, they cannot be lesbian mothers. It's very ironic that I am under police investigation um, for stating things like that, because if he is right, and he really is a woman and a lesbian mother, then he would be excluded from the paragraph that he is currently being protected within. Uh, because that law that, that's being en enacted against me now excludes women. So I think that's ironic. I think that's one of the biggest proofs that this man is in fact a man, because 
if he was a woman, he wouldn't have protection in it. And then it's ironic because if he is what I say he is, which is a man who claims to be a woman, he would in fact be protected by the paragraph. But then, of course, I would be right. And <laughs> so is that the purpose of this law to make uh, reality uh, criminal? Um, so, yeah, no, that's uh, essentially uh, what I've been, uh, yeah, I just wanted to summarize. This is like the progression of how these laws were introduced in Norway. Uh, and like I said, today I've just been listening to this song on repeat. It's got this brilliant line, you know, smoke him if you got him, because it's going down and it's really going down. And I just think that song, I'll have to give you a link. Maybe somebody, if you know which song I'm talking about, can put in the name. Is it Laura Pergulisi? LP. The song is called um, Lost on You. And it's just, it's just such a great demonstration of like, of women who's just doing wh what they know like they they performing from their from with their talents like from this kind of with this kind of you know it's just uh beyond doubt in a sense you know if we, when women can just be truthful it's uh it's just beyond a doubt i just thought this song is kind of in a sense reminiscent to this movement because that tune has been listened to like i think one billion times <laughs> it's six years old uh, but uh, still, it somehow managed to evade like mainstream attention, which I feel is like, you know, a little bit like our cases as well. Like it just uh, evades mainstream attention. Uh, but if you speak the truth, it's uh, it's a lot more. It demands a lot more effort to keep up lies than it does to, to speak the truth. So I'm just kind of. I'm just kind of banking on that, really. OK, well, we're going to go on to our next speaker now, which is who is Claudia. She's from the UK. She's work, has worked full time as an artist potter since 1988. She's known for making big pots that record women's histories and support campaigns against men's violence towards women and girls, especially in the sex trade. She is the subversive author of uh, sorry, the author of Subversive <laughs> Ceramics, Bloomsbury 2016. And uh, thank you so much for coming on, Claudia, and over to you. OK, so we'll just go straight into the next slide so you get a picture to look at. Uh, this pot is called Ararat to Albania. It's huge, by the way. That's about 85 centimetres high, which is nearly a metre. It's big. Um, try to imagine it big. There are pictures coming up of me with the pot, so you'll get some idea of, of sort of scale. Right, okay, so um, what I'm going to do is, I'm, there's going to be an introduction where I'll just talk a bit about my actual practice as an artist, as a potter, um, and then I'm going to talk about the difficulties I have of showing the work, um, and then I'll go, sort of run through the numbers of times that I faced either classic censorship in the old school sense of the word, with um, work being removed from shows or hidden, or um, sort of, but, but the classic example of what censorship normally is. And then um, it moves on to, my, to the, the feminist version, which is being disinvited, also known as deplatforming or canceled, um, which is um, basically if you have a kind of binding contract with an organization and then uh, something kicks off, something blows off and you get removed at the last minute and it's ghastly. Um, so, and, and then I'm going to end up with an analysis. My basic in a sentence thesis for all this is that actually a pre-existing environment of censorship and restriction um, and sort of anxiety in the British art world has really fostered, um, you know, it, it, it has really enabled the attack on feminist artists, on female artists, on lesbian art, and um, and uh, you know, it, you I mean, you will sort of dissect misogyny as part of that right the way through. It's a it's a thread that runs through it from beginning to end. But but it it, it that pre existing censorship is actually part of it. Um, so I make parts. So I've got something to paint on. I actually trained as a painter originally. And I moved over to parts because um, I, I love narrative. 
And the thing about a pot is it turns around. So you've got this opportunity for a kind of narrative to unfold across the surface. You can also see in this one, it gives you this opportunity. There's quite dizzying perspectives that you can get from that shape of the pot, from the, the concave and convex shape. Um, now this one records um, a part of the, it's my kind of memorial pop to, pop to the First World War, and it records this kind of interesting corner of women's history I didn't know about, which was this, the um, founding of the Scottish Women's Hospitals in 1915. These were field hospitals. So it features Elsie Maud Inglis, who's Ingalls, who's the founder of that movement, um, and also Mabel Stowe, Sinclair Stowe Bart, and um, Major Flora Sands, these are really extraordinary women who did very remarkable things during the First World War. There are amazing stories and I do recommend that you kind of pursue um, them. And it, it also gave me a chance to talk actually about the Armenian genocide, which is a, a little bit easily forgotten, I think, and also um, the Great Serbian Retreat, about which I knew nothing. Um, so there, there was, there's plenty going on. In, in that single pot, but it, it was the women's history that I was really after. Our history goes back thousands and thousands and thousands of years. So pot has ways of sort of doing politics and doing political art. What they're not good at is the urgent response. So all those kind of wonderful graphic artists and designers who can you know, turn something around in sometimes a couple of hours and produce memes and t-shirts and marvelous things like they do, um, we're not so great at that. But what POTS are brilliant at is memorialising and remembering. And what you will find you go into any museums, they're stacked full of POTS, usually in the upper floor, the sort of mad woman in the attic that's been forgotten, covered in dust, you know, this sort of thing. Um, you will find yet more forgotten corners of history there. Um, so they're kind of, I, I was kind of interested to take that and try and turn it round and, and use it for recording kind of women's contemporary histories, women's accounts and stories now, and as a way of responding to women experiences. So this is, this pot that you're looking at now um, is, there's this three views of I'm not the criminal, um, which is a part of a project I've done with Women at the Well. Women at the Well is a service based in, it's a women only service. It's based in King's Cross in London. It provides support to women in prostitution and it also helps them to find ways out. They asked me to work with them to produce a collection of pots that um, illustrates the accounts of the women that they support and work with. Um, so this is, um, I'm not the criminal, which kind of records, it's, it's an abolitionist campaign um, that they run, that women in the well also run. And I am an abolitionist feminist. That is, I um, obviously deplore the sex trade and I call, I, uh, campaign and advocate for the complete abolition of the sex trade. Um, and so this, this piece that you're looking at, it, it's depicted on the outside in a very satirical sort of grotesque mode. Uh, the sort of, are the grotesques of the men that use the sex trade that pay for sex and abuse women and girls. On the inside, sort of brightly lit, and bursting their way out of this very oppressive system, which is the sex trade, um, is our, our survivors of the sex trade, this particular individual, Fiona Broadfoot, who is really instrumental in bringing some very important legal reforms. Um, and what you will also see is this pot is broken and mended. And that is another thing that really drew me to ceramics. Materially, as well as being this ancient craft with its, its capacity to, to record histories, it's, it can be broken, it can mended. And I found it to be a compelling metaphor for trauma and survival that people, you often hear women say, I was shattered and now I'm piecing myself slowly back together. And that sense of kind of mending the pot, it, 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 what it did was it helped me to show the, the violence, the real viciousness that's present in sexual violence and in the sex trade but without actually having to reproduce it pictorially, which I really didn't want to have to do. And um, so it, it kind of shows the violence, but equally it shows the survival, the restoration, the mending, the sisterhood, the companionability of putting something back together again. This piece is called Shattered. Um, 
uh, completed in two, it took me four years to do, completed in 2007. And I'm gonna move, um, one of the pieces in this is called Princess Hymen. And it's the one at the far end on the left of the screen. So, I mean, these are vast, these are two meter high pots. I haven't made anything this height since. The, pre, the, the Ararat to Albania, the first pot you looked at is about half the height. And the one directly before, I'm not the criminal, about a third. So, but I mean, they're still quite big pots, even those. Um, so again, you see the shattered and rebuilt um, method approach this. Princess Hyman, um, basically it, it's, it's a kind of meditation, if you like, on, on the whole concept of the virgin body and, the, and how that only affects women. In that piece, I, I also reflect, it's sort of virginity, the virgin body, FGM, virginity testing, the whole culture of virginity. And um, I listened to a great many women's stories in order to help me make this. Um, and they were mostly women actually who lived lo locally, but then through them, I actually met a number of women in Iran. Um, my connection with Iran is more complicated to explain. I do have some family in Iran actually. Um, but um, that's a long story, which I won't go into now. Um, but so, but so there is quite a, it ended up being with a slightly stronger tilt towards the sort of Iranian story. So that's why Princess Hyman and this thing about this kind of testable virginity, testing for the virtue of, of the girl, of the woman um, and, and what all that means. Now I had huge difficulties showing this piece. Um, uh, it was shown in 2009, 2010. Um, there was questions raised around it in 2009. Um, I was able to bring in a feminist to help me sort that out. And, um, and then, but in 2010, it really encountered problems. And Inish Princess Hyman was actually removed from the show initially. I fought back, I managed to get it reinstated by various means, I managed to get the local press and the local vicar on side. The local vicar was an absolute champion. And, um, but her, above all, I got it re reinstated um, and, and the concession was that they would show only one side of it, um, which is the side where you can see with me standing next to it. And, um, and then, the other side was hidden, but hurrah for the great British public because they were then deluged with complaints by the public who said that they could only see half the work, they couldn't see it properly. Um, so I ended up getting compensation for this, although I might add that the people didn't, they didn't actually sort out the way it was displayed so people could see it. The reason given for that cancellation was because of the, the obvious vagina imagery. Well, there is no vagina image on that pot at all. I subsequently found out that actually what was being complained about was, was that, there, I mean, there weren't even any complaints, but what they were worried about was that the local Muslim population might be upset by it in some way because they were worried that I'd been critical of FGM, which is, is in words down the side. I'm afraid you can't see it on this slide. Sorry about that. Um, but there is some text down the side where I actually address more of those issues. And, um, um, but what was so interesting was that they wanted to keep that bit quiet. And that there's a kind of, that's part of this kind of running thread that you'll hear more about. I'll talk more about that. Um, and about how they always seem to hide their fears and then trot out something else to cover it up. Um, what I also found out was then there was no consultation with any of the Muslim populations. And actually, you know, it, this was actually something of a fantasy. This is 2016. And after that debacle at, in 2010, I resolved not to show in public sector spaces anymore because I found they were so censorious and they seemed to be particularly oppressive towards any issues related to women, any feminist work. This one is actually an homage to Charlie Hebdo. This was, um, this is, um, the text actually is blasphemous, possibly. It's a debatable point actually, and I'm not a religious scholar, so I'm not gonna presume too far on that. It, it was done sort of in, to commemorate the, 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 the 
massacre of Charlie Hebdo team and a number of I mean, 17 peoples were murdered by, you know, armed jihadists in Paris on that day. And I made a piece in, to commemorate that event because, I mean, these were artists that were murdered as well as um, you know, a police concierge and four Jews who were shopping and um, murdered because they were Jews, I would like to add. And, um, but this was removed from the show completely and hidden right away so that there was an empty showcase. And um, the reason I was given was that it was because I showed the face of the prophet. Um, now that is a major blunder on, all, on a million different levels. Firstly, there is no prohibition on blasphemy in UK law. Secondly, it's a sectarian move. Manchester, and this was in the um, People's History Museum, Manchester has a large Shia population. It is not prohibited to depict the prophet in Shia Islam anyway. Um, and even in Sunni Islam, it's the veneration that is prohibited, not the imagery itself. So it's all much more complicated than that. Um, so this was again, it was, they refer to it, you know, sensit community sensitivities. Actually, it's not. What's running through this is a spectre of the great big hairy scary Muslim who might well explode. And the sort of fear of a kind of possible Muslim anger that might be there, which, are, you know, it, it, bluntly it is actually racism, this, but it's being paraded as anti-racism and as community sensitivities. Coupled with it is ignorance and fear and, and just anxiety. And now, you know, curators can't know everything. But where they're not sure, they need to ask. And at the very least, come back and talk to the artist. It is possible that the artist knows what she's doing. Um, you know, and where they don't, do what the very first woman did when questions were raised in 2009 over Princess Hyman. She went and talked to a feminist diversities officer in Harringay who advised her properly that there was nothing wrong with that work and that it should be shown. So there is even an example of good practice. This piece is called <coughs> February Dark and Cold. Um, this is, uh, again, part of And the Door Open, the project I'm doing with Women at the Well. This was to be shown in 2019. Um, at, at, and the, the venue is called Crossbone Cemetery. And there was an event to, scheduled to go with it as well. And this was an event that was agreed with the Arts Council, legally binding contract. And um, the reason given was some cock and bull story about the, the, that um, some of their volunteers had decided I was too commercial. And that because I showed in a gallery in Mayfair and all that that entailed was a direct quote from the email that um, I therefore should not be permitted to show at um, Crossbone Cemetery and you know because perish the thought I sell my work because yes you, you know I have to pay the studio rent funnily enough and um but actually the reason which I already knew about and I also got some back channel confirmation from a very reliable source is that sex workers rights activists who by the way were all PhD students they had decided that the work was not sex positive enough and they were sex positive and that this work being an abolitionist piece was too negative and that you know everything about the cemetery where they volunteered was meant to be a healing space and my work was not healing and that it was blah 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 too negative whereas actually of course they just hate abolitionists that's what this this is a pimp lobby we know that so it was vetoed and then, I mean, literally a month later, or I mean, a very short time later, we went into lock COVID and lockdown. And so it was very difficult to discern really what the repercussions of all this were, other than the fact that I got canceled and that, you know, it was difficult for the whole project. So this piece is called Brave Face. Um, this was also part of And the Door Opened. This was going to be displayed at Central St. Martin School of Art in London um, at Ceramic Art London, which is a major weekend art fair event, um, which is organized by the Craft Potters Association of which I am a member. 
and with whom I have worked for decades. And they are in many ways the nearest thing I have to a union. I was going to do a lecture about the project with women at the well. And I was, so I was, yeah, I was going to be talking about pots and accounts of women um, in prostitution. And um, it was going to be, you know, how I, how I make the work and how it, how I work with those women to kind of express the stories that, that they are telling. And I mean, you might remember from the first one I showed, I'm Not the Criminal, that was very much, that was quite a triumphant piece um, with the, the very positive images on the inside and she's breaking out, uh, fighting her own oppression and, and the sort of, the, the, the grotesque ghouls of the sex trade are sort of falling to bits on the outside. The second one, February Dark and Cold, that's a much more kind of nuanced piece. There, she was very much, you know, going through the process if you want to go back to the slide before please do that's that's fine um and but but she's um you know that her, her it, it's very much in the present so some of what she's trying to forget is locked inside the pot and you can partially see it this one brave face it considers the lives of women who might enter the sex trade a bit later in life and um you know i've listened to a great many women tell me that they enter the sex trade in their 20s, frequently in order to pay off a debt, and they thought they could do so easily, and of course found that it was actually much harder to get out once they were in it. Um, so this is really about the brave face that every woman I have ever encountered who has survived the sex trade or who is still caught up within it has to put on to go and meet her client or her pimp, or indeed just to leave the house to go shopping, you know, to cope with life. It's that brave face. And it is, um, on the inside, there are images of these exact same women. And it, I'm thinking about disassociation and that sense of the fragmented self. Now this is, was going to be shown, as I said, at Ceramic Art London, organized by the Craft Potters Association, and to be shown in the, the fair takes place in Central St. Martins. This was the same thing. I was disinvited at the last minute, legally binding contract, trashed, thrown to the four winds. And um, I was, um, you know, um, told after much struggle, what they, they refused to, what I was told initially was that they had been informed that there would be a protest that would shut down the show or at minimum delay it and therefore they couldn't risk showing me and my work. Um, after much pushing, they then said, well, yes, it was because of your, that was because of your gender critical ideas. So take note, nothing to do with what I was going to show or what I was going to say, but what I think, which is the, the Orwellian version of all this. And, you know, no, again, no consultation with me. Nobody made the effort to find out what I think. They just decided they knew. and then. Um, um, I, I've taken legal action, so this, this is now in process, so be a little bit careful with what I say. What we now know, though, is that there was no threat of a protest at all. The entire thing was made up by the organiser at Central St Martins, who was scared there might be a protest, which is a completely different thing. So Kathleen Stock once said, not very long ago, that she felt that it wasn't so much the students were the problem that were the lecturers. I have to say, my experience really bears that out. And that this is, um, in this case, certainly, this made me into a target because all this year then I've had these problems so that I was invited just to go and attend a degree show at Cardiff University, though I was then Disinvite. I then heard that there may be problems because somebody thought that my presence in the building would be incendiary. That was overruled, thankfully, because a very fierce student went to see the dean and complained loudly and kicked up a bus. Hurrah for her. And then um, I was invited to give a talk at Tate Modern. And then um, that was, I was okay, but the woman organizing that faced serious problems from, from Tate. That led to real repercussions 
So that's an example of the knock on that it's not just not only I am the target, but people who work with me become the target. Um, and then the most recent one was a place in Hampstead, which um, I was going to show in. I was going to show the women at the well work again. And then, at the last, you know, I was sent the contract to sign. I looked very carefully at the record of the museum as a whole. I detected there would be problems. I didn't trust them to stand up for me if now knowing that I was a target, that, that there were attacks, as I was sure there would be. And sure enough, they disinvited me. And um, so again, it, it's, it's, I'm now gonna move on to the analysis side of that. So my kind of, again, and, and that wasn't the curator. The curator was keen for me, to, very, very keen to show the work. It was the boss who actually wanted to keep his little coterie nice and secure and not have me showing feminist, sex trade abolitionist work, but they trotted out the gender critical thing again because none of them seemed to notice the full starter judgment or have read the Rheindorf review. So, I mean, in principle, that could have gone to court as well, but I could only got bandwidth for one major issue at the moment. And, um, and so on we go. Um, so that's where I am right now. Um, now, this is what it, 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 it's, I think I, I, I sort of demonstrated that, that there was this pre-existing anxiety, which was, I feel kind of, fueled by a sort of anxiety, a kind of racism around Muslim audiences and how they might react to certain kinds of work. Um, a real failure to, a, a real ignorance and fear about the issues related to that anyway, and a failure to, to really find out about them having had, having been alerted to them. And then um, moving on to the, my most recent cancellations, Although the reason given is certainly an attack on, on gender critical um, feminism, it, I can't ignore the fact that every time that has been brought out, it's been in response to work which is about sex trade abolition. And what um, is also true of the art world is to date, there has never been an exhibition to my knowledge anyway, which showcases those values that are really critical of the sex trade from a properly feminist perspective that advocate sex trade abolition. The only um, politics that they will countenance is full decriminalization. The kind of, if you like, it, it's sometimes referred to as liberal. I, I, there's nothing liberal about it in my view, but the pimp lobby that, the, the, you know, the, the pro-pimp, um, the, 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 the basic pimp and, and punter decriminalization uh, view of it. That's the only view that they will countenance. So big recent show recently at the ICA in London, there have been numerous others, and there has never been a show that um, actually showcases the kind of ideas that I'm, I'm displaying and in my work. Um, apart from now, actually, and, and at Gallery 2 Exits in London, I, I went to see a, a gallery that showcased my work and that, that exhibited my work in the past. And the man who runs it doesn't do, doesn't actually do many exhibitions this year. But when I told him what had happened and I said, look, you might well get a demonstration outside your door or have problems. And he said, well, let the blue heads do their worst. I don't care, bring it on. I'm going to show the work. I can't stand this sort of thing. And he's, he wouldn't even consider himself a feminist. This is a, a commitment to the right for expression that is doing that. But that's a genuine commitment, not the faux commitment that you will often find that a gallery will um, enunciate while not actually following through. Oh, look, we've just, we've just seen this final slide with Leanne. Oh, I'm so sorry, I forgot to say next slide, please. Oh, yes, that yeah, yeah, that's the great. the slide that raised the hornet's nest at the Tate. It was, oh, there was right. no such thing as a woman with a penis. Oh, and, fantastic. And that is what caused the hullabaloo and why the, the organiser then faced repercussions as well as me. Yeah. It's taken me many years to engage the interest of feminists 
Um, it's a very recent thing that I've really succeeded in doing that, um, which I, I have strongly said, I think it's partly my generation, that there was a lot of suspicion about feminine, about art. And I think it's in large part, it's because my generation's feminism came from the left and the left has always been a little bit iffy about art and perceived it as a bit of a bourgeois thing. Um, oh, yeah. But also, I think it's, it, it's partly slogan art is fine, but once you remove the slogans and you start going to send something a bit more complicated and it, it requires a little bit more attention. But the other problem is getting shown. So getting feminist work shown in galleries is really difficult. So it's actually incredibly difficult for feminists to reach me and for me to reach feminists. 